I might say a word about this morning's lecture particularly, and that is it's a slightly different format than the other lectures. There'll be no separate discussion sessions following this, and we'll stay right in here for one session until lunchtime, and following the uh, lecture there will be an opportunity to ask questions. But please, uh, it's uh, more convenient if the questions are in written form. So as a question occurs to you during the lecture, if you please write it down, I'll collect them afterward, and then we'll proceed with a question and answer period on that basis. It's said, as you know, that uh, behind every great man, uh, there is a great woman. Some of you had an opportunity a few minutes ago out at coffee to discover the other half of the uh, Mises combination. We're pleased to have with us today uh, Mrs. Mises, uh, along for moral support of her husband, <laughs> and also, of course, uh, our speaker this morning, uh, Professor Ludwig von Mises, uh, for many years now uh, at New York University. Uh, before that, a distinguished academic career in Europe, first at the University of Vienna, and subsequently at the Graduate Center for International Studies in Geneva. Uh, the dean, of course, of the Austrian School of Economics, the author of Human Action, and uh, many other works. Uh, our speaker this morning, originally, uh, as you see from your schedule, had planned to speak on property, but because of the tremendous interest centering in questions of money and inflation, he would asked me to announce that he would uh, prefer to speak on another topic this morning, one that I'm sure would be of particular interest, uh, the problems of inflation. And so it's my very great pleasure to present to you Professor Ludwig von Mises. It is very fashionable today to make silly jokes about our monetary system and especially about the problem of the gold standard. Uh, there are authors who are writing uh, essays, leave the uh, gold to the dentists. Now <laughs> the dentists are certainly interested in gold and other people too, but uh, I would like to attack the problem from the other end and say there is nothing in the world less uh, fit to serve as money than paper, printed paper. You know. Nothing is cheaper and practically what we have to see is that uh, the governments are destroying the whole economic system of uh, the market economy by uh, <coughs> destroying the monetary system. Uh, there was uh, uh, some years ago you could read again and again quotations saying that uh, Lenin said that the best method to destroy the free enterprise system would be to destroy the monetary system. Now, uh, uh, a professor in Germany has demonstrated that Lenin never said this. But if he had said it, it would have been the only uh, correct uh, thing that he ever said. <laughs> now, uh, what we have to realize is this. Money is a market phenomenon. That means money is a medium of exchange. And <coughs> in the course of the historical evolution, various uh, commodities have been uh, employed for the service of a medium of exchange uh, until finally only two commodities remained, the precious metals, silver and gold, and then in the course of the 19th century, uh, also silver disappeared from its uh, service as uh, a medium of exchange, and what remained was gold alone. Now, the uh, quality that makes it makes gold fit for this service 
is precisely the fact that the uh, uh, quantity of gold cannot be manipulated by the government. The uh, quantity of money is the decisive problem. And the, what the governments are doing is either to retain the uh, character of gold as a medium of exchange or to and to make it possible for people to uh, operate such a standard or and this is the uh, reason which that we have to deal with all these problems in such a way as we have to deal with them today or the government employ the monetary system for the destruction of the money economy. If a government doesn't know what to do, it wants to bribe the people by <coughs> paying something to it. Paying without having collected the means required for this payment by taxation. And this means, this is what the governments are doing, this is inflation, you know. If we hear today the governments uh, talk about inflation, uh, they describe inflation as something that happens, one doesn't know why, or another version that is due to the activities, to the bad actions of the people. The people is responsible. Uh, let us uh, take the uh, uh, most popular case, uh, the problem of uh, uh, foreign exchange. We have we, the, uh, we have today a situation in which the various governments in their inflationary measures do not act in concert. That means one government goes farther in its inflationary measures and the other <coughs> government does not go as far as these other governments. And therefore, there are continually changes in the mutual exchange ratios of the various countries' governmental money. Uh, I want to, uh, as the time is very limited, for the interpretation of such a complicated problem, the most important, practically today, the most important problem, I want to uh, enter immediately into a crit criticism of the uh, popular governmental doctrine of the balance of payments. According to the ideas of the government, the various governments, or let us also say, of the American government as uh, uh, manifested in its pl plans and measures of the last months. The reason why the prices of expressed in dollars are going up quicker than prices expressed in other uh, in some other currencies is due to whom? Of course, to you, to the people. The people is responsible. It, uh, people are responsible because they are drinking champagne, because they are traveling in foreign countries. Why do they speak about uh, champagne and about uh, uh, traveling in foreign countries, because these are, as the, as the governments uh, consider it, luxury things. 
Therefore, what the government does is simply say, look at these bad people who are drinking champagne. They are responsible for the inflation, for the higher prices. They are responsible for all evils under the sun. Uh, what the, the government does not say is that uh, these people, if they are prevented from drinking champagne and therefore sending money to France, uh, would spend for something else. They would either invest this money or they would spend this money for consumption. They would not take the dollars which they are uh, using today according to the ideas of the government for drinking champagne, they will not put these dollars into a, a package and send this package to the government and send it here, <coughs> have more money for paying the deficits of your enterprises of the post office, for instance, and so on. They would buy something else. If they are buying something else at the domestic market, the prices of these things would go up on account of the fact that there is now a greater demand for it. And these things would become less uh, available, less fit for exporting. Therefore, if you prevent people from uh, spending the money abroad, then they will spend the money on the domestic market either for consumption or for investment. But whatever they are doing, they will bring about higher prices for some things which previously were exported. And these things will not no longer be exported. If you do, if you are, if the governments were consistent in their ideas, they would make all Imports impossible. And what will the govern what will the people do with the money? They will buy more on the domestic market. They will bring about higher prices on the domestic market, either of consumers' goods or of producers' goods. There is no third group of, of uh, uh, commodities. And they would uh, uh, and they would restrict exports to the same extent that they are importing imports, necessarily. If the governments were consequent and could be consistent in this regard, they would prevent every business with foreign countries. Then every country will remain uh, isolated economically, and prices will go up on account of the fact that the government increases the quantity of domestic money. If this is done consist in a consistent way, it would bring about a restriction, complete end of international trade. The, uh, 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 way in which the American government deals with the problem is only one of the ways in which the government justifies their action. This is the way of the uh, luxury excuse. But there is a second way for countries in which the imports consist predominantly of uh, goods that are considered as necessary and indispensable by public opinion. In such countries, uh, the, for instance, these countries are the, all those European countries that are predominantly industrial, exporting industrial uh, products manufacturers in order to import food and raw materials. In such countries, they say, 
what what uh, uh, is responsible for our uh, unfavorable development of foreign exchange rates is the fact that we are poor in so far as we cannot produce on our own territory all the foodstuffs and raw materials we need and have to import them. These other nations, the have nations, are exploiting us. Mm. This is the version which, uh, uh, for instance, uh, was used by uh, Mussolini in order to justify his aggression. Why must we uh, uh, go to war against other countries? Because we are forced to import things which uh, uh, are absolutely necessary for the support of the life and health and so on of our population. You see, the uh, result of uh, all these uh, policies would be more and more self-sufficiency or to use a foreign word, a Greek word, which is uh, uh, mostly pronounced in, a, in the wrong way outside of Greece, autarchy. Autarchic. I mention this word because you will find it very often uh, uh, used in all uh, articles and books dealing with these problems. Now, why is this bad, can this bad situation only develop between national units and not with international units? In uh, uh, Europe, uh, there are uh, uh, several <coughs> governments of uh, several nations, the population of which is either smaller or not much larger than the population of many American states. Uh, the, why don't you hear the same uh, complaints which you hear about, uh, let us say, the uh, comportment of some people who are buying champagne and uh, are therefore enriching France and impoverishing the United States, why don't you hear the same thing about the various American states? Because the Americans, the various states of the Union, have no independent um, monetary policy, can therefore not make a, um, in, a inflation in Iowa that is not at the same time and to the same extent also an inflation in 49 other states of the Union. And you must not go to the states. When you say what is, when people say what is bad in the relation between the United States and France is, is that France produces and sells to the United States only goods which are very frivolous, very bad goods, immoral goods, uh, uh, books, uh, uh, novels, uh, the theatrical performance in Paris, uh, opera production and concerts in Paris, and champagne, you know. <laughs> which is the worst, the worst is <laughs> say the same thing also between, let us say, Brooklyn and Manhattan. Uh, Manhattan sells theatrical performances, concerts and so on in a greater number to the people from Brooklyn. These people of Brooklyn are spending, uh, the, uh, this other man in Brooklyn says, why does my neighbor spend his money to attend the performance of a of an opera in uh, Manhattan. Why does he not spend his money in Brooklyn? And if you go step by step farther in the same direction, you arrive to perfect autarchy 
self-sufficiency, isolation, economic isolation of every individual family, and perhaps even within the family, one could say, why should not uh, a boy say uh, uh, against his brother or sister or against his parents, I want to be autarchic. For the same reasons, consequently and consistently developed, for which uh, to, uh, one of the countries in the world they wants to be autarchic and prevents the importation of things from other countries. It is one of the many things, of the many contradictions which we have in our, not economic system, in our political system. The dreadful contradiction that, for instance, to only to uh, uh, refer to one point in order to make it, uh, to explain you what I have in mind, uh, the dreadful contradiction that, for instance, the American government says we are, we have to wage a war against poverty, so many people are poor and we must make them wealthier, and this government taxes the people in order to make bread more expensive. And you will say, also bread more expensive, this is an exception, it's not an exception, but because the American government spends also billions of tax money in order to make cotton more expensive. Cotton goods, cotton goods are certainly, or they are very in the past, cotton goods are certainly not uh, luxury goods. They are perhaps luxury goods when compared with bread, but with bread the government makes the same thing, the same policy. But we have not to, uh, we must not refer to this point. You know. The thing is that the individual cannot do anything that uh, makes the inflationary uh, machine and mechanism work. This is done by the government. The government makes the inflation. And if the government complains about the fact that prices are going up and, uh, and uh, appoints committees of uh, learned men uh, to fight against the inflation, we have only to say nobody else than the government brings about inflation. Uh, if the government wants to spend, the government has two ways that do not make inflation, they do not destroy the monetary system and the market organization. It can tax the citizens, you know what this means, or it can borrow from somebody who has the money, you know. But, what, but if the government prints simply the money, increases the quantity of the money, or borrows from the commercial banks by forcing them to, uh, uh, to credit the government on checking accounts, then, all the, then there is a greater quantity of money available, and available in an environment, in a milieu, in which the quantity of goods and services did not increase. On the one hand, the government increases <coughs> the quantity of money. On the other hand, the government has not the power to increase the quantity of goods. And the result is that the exchange ratio is changed. And the result is higher prices. And the government says higher prices Look, these people, look, this, uh, <coughs> this uh, corporation, this bad man, the president of this corporation, uh, this uh, 
Even if the government, I don't want to talk about the unions, but also if the government uh, blames the unions, we have to realize what the unions can not do is to increase the quantity of money. And therefore, uh, all the activities of the unions are within the frame that is built by the government in influencing the quantity of money. If the government issues additional money for a wonderful purpose, let us say, the government wants, for instance, let us say, to uh, make it possible for everybody uh, to spend some time in Paris drinking champagne. <laughs> Let us say. And the French, and the French are uh, uh, nice enough to say, we will take your American paper dollars. What is will the result be? There will be on the market a higher quantity of this American money, and this higher quantity of money will necessarily bring about a change in the exchange ratio between the various uh, uh, goods and services on the one hand and the monetary unit on the other hand. The, uh, uh, this is the problem which we have to take into account. And now the government says, or let us say, it's not the, the government, it is the, the servants of the government. They say, yes, who is against this increase in the quantity of money? Who is it? The rich people. We are doing something very useful, necessary, and beneficial for the masses. Why? Because if the quantity of money increases and therefore the purchasing power of the monetary unit, popularly called in this country the dollar, decreases, this means that the burden of debt becomes easier, that the poor debtors are favored at the expense of the rich creditors. Wonderful idea. And it was what the government says, what the American government says in this direction, or, or some people say, is was perfectly correct 2,500 years ago in the city of Athens when the wise man Solon had to deal with some problems which we in our language, which we use today, would call social problems. At that time, the debtor was typically the poor man. And the creditor was the rich man. And if these people said, if Solon said, I have uh, made a reform in favor of the uh, poor strata of the population and for the benefit and for and at the expense of the richer groups, he was perfectly right. So we are many reformers in later ages. But under capitalistic conditions, it is very different. In the pre-capitalistic ages, people who uh, had the, uh, who were creditors <coughs> were rich people, and you could say that the debtor is a poor man. But 
We do no longer live in the days of Solon of Athens, unfortunately, some people may say. And we do no longer live under the conditions in which the authors in the Middle Ages and in the 16th and 17th century dealt with these problems. Capitalism has enriched the masses, not all of them, of course, because capitalism is, has still to fight with the hostility of the government. But under capitalistic conditions, it is no longer true that the creditors are the rich and the debtors are the poor. Capitalism has developed a great system of making possible for the masses of the poorest threat of the population, that means of the people who have less. I don't want to say that they are poor in the sense uh, in which one uses the uh, term. I want only to say they are poorer than the rich people, than the entrepreneurs and so on. And capitalism has developed a system in which these people are in a position to save and to invest indirectly these savings in the operation of business. The rich people are owners, for instance, of common stock of a corporation. But the corporations own money either because they have uh, issued uh, 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 bonds, corporate bonds, or because they have a current uh, uh, connection with a bank uh, in employing in the conduct of their affairs money lent to them by the banks. <coughs> and the banks have this money from the savings account of simple citizens. The masses, the great the, the people whom we call less uh, wealthy than the richer people have invested their savings in savings deposits in bonds, in insurance policies, and so on. And they are therefore creditors, while the great millionaires, the owner of real estate, the real of uh, the owners of uh, 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 common stock, and so on, are in this regard debtors. And if you do something, as all the governments practically do, if you do something against the uh, purchasing power of the monetary unit, you are hurting today under present day conditions, not the rich, but you are hurting the middle classes and the masses of people who have, who are saving all their life in order to enjoy a, a better old age and in order to make it possible for them to educate their children and so on. And therefore, the, one of the greatest changes brought about by capitalism is precisely this. The, the part that the less fortunate, I don't want to use the term the poorest rate again, the less fortunate groups of the population are poor, have, is legally in 
the sense in which we are talking about creditor and debtors if an activity of the masses. And if the government uh, and uh, uh, if the, there are certain smaller exceptions. And one of the exceptions in this country is precisely the fact that the government gives special privileges to the rich in order to attract them uh, to, uh, to the market of uh, government bonds. Government bonds uh, are uh, to some extent tax-free. This is a very complicated system, but uh, it is, one could uh, call it simply a, a system they have uh, privileges in the way of taxes in order to make also the wealthier strata of the population to be interested in buying uh, government bonds and in this way to make it possible for the government to spend more. But if the government, if the uh, by and large, we have to say, the great, much greater part of the uh, privileges of the benefits, and the quotation marks benefits, <coughs> which the people derive from the uh, uh, inflationary policy, does not go to the masses, but on the contrary, is paid by the masses. That means, uh, to give you a, an example, uh, I don't want to refer to Germany because the German, uh, the German inflation was really so excessive and so crazy and so uh, with, uh, done without any, any uh, idea of economic wisdom that I don't want to, to talk about it at all. But take France. Not so long ago, the French government uh, had to declare what we uh, uh, call today 100 francs is from mo tomorrow on only one franc. You know? And this was not the first time that they did it and it was not the last time. It means that the uh, 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 French government has deprived the great number of middle class and lower class Frenchmen of their savings. Uh, the interest, the everything that is done by a government against the uh, uh, purchasing power of the monetary unit is under present day conditions done against the middle classes and the uh, working classes of the population. Only that these people don't know it. And this is a tragedy. The tragedy is that the unions and all these people are supporting a policy that makes all these savings valueless. And this is the great danger of the whole situation. Uh, the, uh, uh, this, the, uh, the people are destroying the purchasing power of the monetary unit is not only to be seen and to be uh, uh, judged and appreciated from the point of view of what is done to current incomes and current consumption habits, it has to be seen also from the point of view of the accumulation of reserves and of private ownership by the masses. Uh, the, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, that such movements 
Est-ce des euh, revolutionary movements in various European countries develop was due to the fact that one day the people had to discover that what they have saved to all her li their lives in order to improve the conditions of the members of their families, in order to improve the conditions of their children and grandchildren, that all this has disappeared, entirely disappeared, by the monetary policy which the governments had adopted. Uh, I say entirely disappeared, because uh, Take this French example which I mentioned. 100 francs are only one franc today. Uh, that means if it had been the only time that this was done in France, it was done several times, I can't enter into the whole history of this, but it means that nothing is left. Because the number of people who could consider as something valuable 1% of their life's savings is very small, practically non-existent. Therefore, what you have to, re what the individual American has to realize if he deals with these problems is that a policy of inflation, a policy which, uh, 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 reduces the purchasing power of the monetary unit, makes it impossible for him to organize his working, earning, and spending and saving in such a way that he could provide for the future of his family. And this is why the inflationary policy is the most radical revolutionary institution in the world. We, uh, uh, if we have to realize this, and we have to change the opinion of the people who believe that the problem of the gold standard means something that concerns only groups of business, small groups of the people and so on. If we want to have a, a, a system in which the uh, individual can plan for his own life and for the life of his family. If we want to have a system in which uh, people can say, if I have uh, the opportunity to work and to save, I will improve my own conditions and the conditions of my family, then you can have a regular system of what one used to call bourgeois security ones. But if the governments destroy again and again the savings of the, uh, their uh, uh, citizens, they bring about a situation in which uh, people do what these people in the various Europe uh, communist countries did, and in which you think, in which you hear of uh, violence and uh, actions of destruction again and again. You have to realize that there are no miracles possible for uh, government, that the government is not in a position 
to do something which it didn't for, uh, to spend something that it didn't previously collect from its citizens. And in order to avoid the visible collection, the governments prefer invisible collection. And then they say, you see, you never had it so good as you have today. Why? Because uh, uh, when, when you uh, uh, are looking backward at the end of the year, on the past year, you say, now my uh, income increased by several percent. Why did it increase? Because the government, it's very modest, the government, the government says not because we printed the money, the government says, because everything is so wonderful when we are dealing with these systems. And therefore, all these, uh, if you read in the newspapers, these wonderful stories about paper gold. Nobody knows what paper gold is, you know. There are paper cigarettes, but paper gold is something which, which the government promises, perhaps, but there is no, no uh, uh, thing that can really achieve these things. And then I want to uh, add something which is also very important to realize. There is no way of increasing the quantity of money, although of decreasing, but nobody talks of decreasing openly, they only do it. There is no way of increasing the quantity of money in a neutral <coughs> way. That means money can never be neutral. Uh, if the government says, uh, and this is a, one of the great mistakes which is, uh, that uh, are very popular, uh, people say, uh, as conditions are uh, uh, improving, one needs more and more money. One doesn't need more and more money. Uh, if, and if one increases the money, one can never increase the quantity of money in a neutral way. That means in a way that does not further the economic conditions of one group at the expense of other groups. Uh, take for in, this is, for instance, something which uh, this uh, uh, great, I don't find a nice word to describe it, let us say this great error in starting the International Monetary Fund didn't realize. You know. This even this dreadful ignoramus who was uh, uh, called Lord Keynes, had not the slightest idea of it, but also to other people. Not, it was not his fault. Why permitted the other people to uh, him to do this? The idea is this. If there is a, uh, an international bank issuing a world money for all countries, and now they say we want in to increase we want to increase the quantity of money. Because they say because uh, uh, there are now more people born. All right. Give it to them. Then the question is who gets the additional money? And the same is true for the problem if there are lots of books uh, of a so-called economists who are publishing textbooks and in every edition of the textbooks they uh, give a, in every new edition they give another figure for the yearly increase of the quantity of money. For us we said 8%, 6%, 5%. This is uh, useless talk, you know. The thing is that the question would always be to whom give you this additional quantity? No. Because if 
the additional quantity is given to somebody else, your conditions are impaired. Let us say this, the international, the idea of the international bank uh, again and again was there are poor countries in the world. Yes, there are. Give them additional money. This additional money means that somebody has the power to buy more than he bought yesterday. And this brings prices going up. This means that those people who didn't get the additional money are now not only in the same situation they were yesterday, this wouldn't be, no, they are in a, now in a poorer position. They are worse because they have their quantity of money in their pockets did not increase, but prices did increase, you know. This is the, this is the uh, problem the people never understood. If you take, uh, for instance, the, uh, such a, <coughs> an American textbook says, and forget about the rest of the world, take only America, isolated from the whole world. They say they need every year more money. We will give them more money. All right. But to whom? No. Those people who are getting, to are first getting the money, let us say certainly to the government, you would say yes. <laughs> but the people who are the first to receive the money from the government, because the government buys these things, because the government, let us say, says uh, we will give to uh, 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 all uh, people of a certain quality, a certain quantity of money, they are now in a position to buy more. Their competition on the market raises prices. And you are here and you did not get anything from the additional money. You are there for her pay. You are, this does not mean simply, uh, as these people, if you read these books, if you take this back to you say, every year the government will be able to distribute more money. Wonderful. It can distribute more money, but it cannot distribute more goods. And this is the question. As this additional money will raise the prices of wood, you, who did not get anything of this additional money, you are hurt. And this is what people don't realize and they don't see. And therefore, this uh, 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 money that is increased every year means only that other groups will then say, why do, did we not get more? Then the government will give them two a quantity and then against to the others. And this is what we are getting today, you know. This is the present day situation in most of the countries. There is one group that wants to get something. The government gives them, then the other groups make also a demand. And in this way, the purchasing power of the monetary unit is continually dropping. <coughs> Wonderful, say the people. This means that the debts are uh, getting smaller. But the debts are precisely the riches of the masses. <laughs> the uh, debts are getting smaller means that the owners of common stock getting richer at the expense of those who have 
board corporate bonds and so on. The, uh, uh, I would say, therefore, to the government, there are among the government people some who really believe in this thing, <coughs> that they should study the problem. They should study the problem because there is no such thing as a neutral money. There is no neutrality on the market because the situation of the various people is different. Because every group is in another situation, and if you uh, do something for the benefit of one group, you must ask yourself, but the printing press cannot make people richer. The government prints money and gives it to one group of the people and makes them richer. Yes. At the expense, necessarily at the expense of other people, you know. And this is the thing that people do not realize when they are talking about these various plans, you know. It, uh, uh, it's unbelievable that we have now already for a long time, for many years already, textbooks that from time to time say, that uh, in every new edition say that the uh, quantity of money must increase, uh, but that's this uh, 2% or 5% or 7%, it's, they change it from year to year. This is without any importance. But the question is, they do not see that the increase in the quantity of money, that inflation, does not at the same time and to the same extent affect the wealth and the income of various groups of the population, that money therefore necessarily cannot be neutral and therefore we must be very modest in planning new monetary ideas. In a time of inflation, in a time of monetary troubles, it is one of the, uh, it is a very popular pastime for certain people to make plans for an ideal money. But there is no ideal money, and the money which will uh, have as gold standard money has the advantage that its changes are very slowly and are completely within the system of the monetary organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lucas. Uh, one of those questions. Now we have time for several before we go to lunch. <coughs> about inflation, because deflation is unpopular enough also without any observations which I may add to it. Uh, the, uh, to give you an, uh, let us say, an not very scientific but rather uh, correct uh, interpretation, I would say, if some people believe that the cure of inflation is deflation, and some people believe, but there are very few, that if a man was hurt by a motor car, then the cure is to let the motor car go over him in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll read these aloud here, pick and choose. Too many questions. What do you suggest as a means of setting temporary of settling temporary balance of payments situations? Do we continue using gold at the present price? Free exchange notes? Word that I cannot determine. I uh, want <laughs> go ahead. I yes, want to say gold what I said at the beginning. Gold has one virtue, that it cannot be printed. 
And whatever you can say, if, uh, there, uh, you cannot prevent uh, governments from using the printing press if they are, if, if the, their, their period in office, the length of their period in office depends on it. Whatever you may say, even if one were to say that uh, the that capital punishment is, has to be uh, sorted to and so on, this wouldn't make any change. But it is impossible to fabricate gold. Perhaps one day people, the science will discover a method to produce gold in the same way in which we can to produ produce today uh, uh, these paper things which we call money. Uh, then people will have to find something else. And we don't know what the situation, if this can ha will happen, what the situation will be, and therefore we can't make plans for such an eventuality. But today we have this situation and we must not uh, abandon it for some reasons in order to make it possible for somebody uh, to uh, go to war and to be defeated in this war and uh, and so you know you know enough from history about this what part has a massive expansion of credit played in the prosperity of our present economy would the economy have expanded at its present rate without the modern credit economy the second question. What the, what the uh, uh, expansion of credit means and what it brings about has been described by a doctrine which is uh, very unpopular with the governments and with the bankers, but which that says, that describes it precisely. The trade cycle, the business cycle, and the, and the end of the trade and business cycle, the depression, are the effects of the uh, attempts of various governments again and again to improve conditions by credit expansion. And the details can be read in some books. I recommend you especially the book by uh, Dr. Rothbard, uh, I think the title is uh, America's Great Depression. There are a number of these credits, I'm sorting through to try some of these, of course, repeat one another, and I'm trying to avoid some of those. Uh, we'll try another one here. You say that the government increasing the amount of money in circulation really helps no one. If the money is distributed to people with no money before this new distribution, are not they in a better economic position? Well, the government helps itself. You can't say that doesn't help it at all. You say, but the government, is, if the money is distributed to people with, money, with no money before this new distribution, are not denied in a better economic position. Uh, they, uh, uh, you cannot, by increasing the quantity of money, avoid effects upon production. And this is what brings about this thing. I want to say, you know, we could, uh, one should not talk about money in the way in which I have talked today. That means one should say if, to an uh, audience, if you want to hear something about money, then you must, uh, uh, I am prepared to talk to you about money, but uh, let us say two weeks every day, every day of two weeks, this is for 14 days, 
four hours a day, 56 hours, and then two hours every day for you to ask questions, which I will answer. Uh, in one hour, you can't deal with this problem. You know, it were possible to deal with the problem of money in one hour and with the other problems of uh, uh, the economy in five or six hours or eight hours, I don't know how much the seminar has, then the world would be very simple. Unfortunately, the world is not as simple as that. And we must try to uh, uh, make these things as clear as possible. I want what I consider as very important under present day conditions is to tell people that it is impossible to improve conditions by inflation. While the, and so the inflation is uh, something that can only destroy and not produce something. And secondly, that inflation is something that is always done by the government alone, by the government alone, without, even if the government does it for the profit or for the alleged profit of some special groups and so on. You know. uh, it is useless to see uh, what, what people uh, are believing today is that if a corporation or an individual uh, raises prices, this is inflation. This is not inflation. And an individual cannot do this if there is no conditions. If, you, if a man asks a higher price than the potential market price, then the result is that he does not sell anything. The inflation consists in the not in the fact that prices are going up, but it consists in the fact that the quantity of money is increased, and therefore a greater quantity of money chases, as people sometimes say, a not increased quantity of goods. You know. 